Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. We are glad you're here with us today. We are blessed to have you know, Elena here to give us some music. We are blessed to have Pastor Carla here to present our, our message to us. So we are just blessed all around. And we're blessed to have Linda up in the choir loft. <laughs> A couple of announcements. Um, our refugee project, which, you know, we started a year ago is come our 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 sponsorship is coming to an end and they are doing fantastic um, both parents have jobs mia the daughter ha has been going to frederick community college their son has been doing well at uh, i think it's frederick high school um, middle but he's going into high school right sam But they are all doing very well, and they have established themselves. And so today at Good Shepherd in Frederick on 7th Street, there's a celebration. So anybody who's been involved in this project is welcome to come out and just, you know, greet the tunes again and have some food, fellowship, and just reconnect. So I would invite you to do so. July 20th, Roxanne is having food at Woodsboro Lutheran Church. Again, that's a part of how we joyfully feed the body, mind, and spirit of all, and Roxanne will gladly tell you it, how you can help. So see Roxanne. Won't you be glad to tell them how to help? We are continuing uh, this month, the month of July, for our special offering for Christ in our harbor. They are in the process of figuring out how they are going to rebuild. And again, fortunately, no one was hurt. And I believe even last week they had worship in the chapel. Correct, Pastor Carlo? So they had worship in their chapel, which is a great step forward. So we are asking for a special offering this month to help them uh, subsidize their rebuilding. July 28th, minute to win it. So see Amy, that's our, our, our continued outreach at Victoria Park. There will be games and food and I think... So see Amy. April 10th is Faith Night at the Keys Park. If you're interested in going to a baseball game and we're interested in going together, give, give Joanne a call or email the office so that if we want to get a group, a bunch of group uh, folks together, we can do that. And again, as I mentioned, Pastor Carl is here today to preach to us the good news and some news of love. So please, quiet your hearts for worship. Amos reports his vision of God judging Israel for its mistreatment of the poor. He becomes a threat to the power of the priests and the king. John the Baptist also speaks truth to power, and Herod has him killed. In Herod's fear that Jesus is John returned from the dead, we may hear hope for the oppressed of all prophets, killed through the ages and are alive in Jesus. We are called to witness to justice in company with them and to proclaim God's saving love.
Please stand as you're able. The Holy Spirit calls us together as people of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we can, may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God, from whom you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. happened that I sing a lot more now outside of my band and other guest singing opportunities and I sang last night up in Shippensburg at the it's Parks Casino but it's called the side pocket it's a it's the I don't gamble I, it's a side pocket and there's a <laughs> there's a blues uh, group that I sing with so you know it's loud in there from the all the machines and all but um, so it just so happens that the song I chose today happens to also be a cappella again I seem to be on an acapella kick, so this one is um, new for you guys, or new for me singing it here, sharing it with you, and it's Beth Nielsen Chapman. It's called The Flame. I think it actually turns out to be a little appropriate these days, so we'll see. So I'm going to sing in a lower key. I'm going to have to go higher. You're fine. You know I project, so it's loud. flame keep it through the night nourish it and share its warmth and spend its precious light the torch is passed among us all and to help us understand a covenant of brotherhood that joins our open hand. We are standing at the edge, faced with just one choice. Teach each other to be kind, and let our hearts rejoice. As different as we seem to be, we are still the same. Divided by our separate walls, but joined before the flame. O oh, come ye now unto the flame, keep it through the night. Shelter and embrace its warmth, and spend its precious light. 
The darkness makes us all afraid, but we are not alone. The beacon of our common love will guide our journey home. Thank you. The first reading for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost comes from the seventh chapter of Amos, verses seven to 15. Amos is not the kind of prophet attached to temples or royal courts. Rather, he is an ordinary farmer from Judah, the southern kingdom, called by God to speak to Israel, the northern kingdom. God's word of judgment through Amos conflicts with the king's court prophet, Amaziah, whom Amos encounters at Bethel. The first reading, this is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from, the following, from following the flock and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Here ends the first reading, the word of the Lord. Amen. Today's Psalm is Psalm 85, res read responsibly by the half first, beginning with verse eight. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying. Truly, your salvation is very near to those who fear you. That your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity. And our land will yield its increase. Righteous shall go before the Lord and shall prepare for God a pathway. Here ends the psalm. The second reading for today comes from the first chapter of Ephesians, verses three to 14. In Jesus, all of God's plans and purposes have been made known as heaven and earth are united in Christ. Through Jesus, we have been chosen as God's children and have been promised eternal salvation. The second reading. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. 
With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Here ends the second reading, the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. And to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised? For Herod himself had sent men to arrest John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with others to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, that's a fun way to open the morning, isn't it, church? (laughs) But you know, one thing I love about this story about Herod in connection to our world and our day today is that it reminds us that we have choices. That when we know what is right, but there are different people's ideas of what right might be. When we may have made a promise, but somehow that promise may cause hurt or harm to innocent people. When there is the law and there is what is kind. 
and they are not the same. There's all kinds of these conundrums in a life of faith, is there not? Herod, Herod did the right thing. He made a promise. He kept it. He told the truth. He did exactly what a man of honor was supposed to do. So he did the right thing, right? Good choice. John the Baptist, head on a platter, promise fulfilled. <laughs> right? But if he had said, no, this, this man is, he's not only innocent of crime, he's wise and he's kind. He has helped people. He is inspiring me. I am learning and growing and becoming a better leader because of him. It is not the right thing to do to fulfill this promise. He would have had to break a promise not to kill an innocent man. What is the king, what is the church to do? I'll get back to that. First of all, it's lovely to meet those of you I have not gotten to meet yet. I'm Carla. And I work with Bishop Goh at our Synod office. I'm the assistant to the Bishop for Justice Ministries, which is really a lot to put on one line on a business card. But essentially, it means that I get to work with congregations that are having conversations about what does it mean to be a welcoming and invitational community. And the reason I'm so passionate about this is because according to law, I'm actually Jewish. See, according to Jewish law, your religion is inherited. It comes through the line of the mother, and my mother was a conservative Jew. She was also rather a spicy maverick of the 70s. I know everyone in here, the 70s is too long ago for you to remember. But, <laughs> but back in the, the days that my, my artsy mother was gallivanting through the streets of DC, as you could probably tell from looking at me, I don't look exactly like your typical DC Jewish woman because my artsy mother met a very dashing jazz musician who played at one of her arts opening. And I was born about nine and a half months later. <laughs> it was the 70s, come on. <laughs> what that meant is that she was excommunicated from her conservative Jewish community. Her friends, her family, people she'd grown up with, gone to school with, people that she had spent her life being sheltered by and sheltering. You see, there were a lot of members in the community who still very much remembered that just a few years earlier, children like me were still against the law because interracial relationships were not legal. And so I was referred to as everything from a poor choice to an outright abomination who should not exist. And so the faith community that nurtured my mother told her she was no longer welcome there. Now here's the problem. As a conservative Jewish woman, independence, financial management, home raising, even caring for a child on your own is not something that is traditionally taught at least not in the community that she was raised in. So she was now a single mother without the ability to pay bills, credit cards. I mean, in this era, again, I know all of you do not remember this time, but there was a time in which 
women couldn't actually get credit cards, business accounts, without the signature of their husband or a male guardian. So this was not stuff she was super familiar with. But there were a few women in town that spotted this young woman with a baby seeming utterly lost. She had come to them for help with food, and they engaged in conversation and said, tell us your story. And when she told her story, they said, perhaps there are ways that we can help. This little group of women taught my mother to cook, to keep house, helped her get back in school. My mother was the first woman to graduate from University of Detroit Law School that allowed, and a class that allowed women to graduate. And she became a women's rights attorney who supported survivors of domestic violence, who did women's rights work, who supported women refugees, and who became an incredible role model, not just for her daughter, but for many other women. I'll give you three guesses where that group of women came from. A church. So I was raised as a Christian because it was the church that made a choice that was countercultural, that was not incredibly popular, that for many meant embracing someone who was not a paragon of faithful living, and yet who did tremendous good when shown love and welcome. And as a result, her child was brought up with a deep love and unyielding faith in Jesus Christ and the healing power of grace and salvation that had those women not making that choice would never have been exposed to. And so the church was my safe place. The church was grace embodied. The church was healing and hospitality right up until I went to college, fell head over heels in love with my judo sensei, who happened to be a woman. And the first person that I told was my Bible study leader. And I said, help me because I've been taught that this isn't what I'm supposed to be feeling. This isn't who I'm supposed to be. And I don't know how to reconcile what feels so natural and so right to me. But I also know that being in the church and being a daughter of the church feels so right to me. And I don't know how to balance these two things. And he said, there's a place that I can send you for help. I need you to give me your cell phone. I need you to get on this bus. And we're going to send you to a little place where they can fix you. I'm not going to tell you a lot about what happened there. But I will tell you that when I escaped through a window, in the middle of a January snowstorm and hitchhiked to a truck stop and called my uncle, who, God bless him, drove through two states overnight to find me and bring me home. I knew two things. One was that I was still gay, and I promise you, that if I could have given it up in that moment, I would have. Forgive me. And I also knew that I never wanted to go through the doors of another church again. Because there is no greater pain that I have ever felt 
than feeling like God could not love me as I was and for who I was. And it was 10 years before I walked through the doors of a church again. It was 10 years before I physically could walk through the doors of a church again. Because when I would try, missing the music, missing the community, missing the opportunities for service, my heart would start pounding. My stomach would twist into knots. My legs would turn into jelly. My very body said, that's not a safe place for you. They don't want you there. And I couldn't make it through the doors. I became a social worker. I supported young people in the way that I wish I had been supported. I offered safety, healing, help, and accompaniment to families navigating, balancing what they had been taught, what felt like the honorable thing, and how do I practice love? Because it can be a challenge sometimes. And I was in a coffee shop one day, just making my way through the city, had a lot of business meetings there. And there was a guy, and I thought he might have been a Catholic priest or something, because he had the collar and the black shirt. But he had a little card on his little table sitting next to him, and it said, ask a pastor, ask me anything, exclamation point. I was curious enough to look a little closer, and I realized he was drinking from a Harley Davidson coffee mug with flames on it. And I couldn't help it. I said, is that something a pastor is supposed to be drinking out of? And without missing a beat, he looked at me and said, it's my fire and brimstone mug. I laughed out loud. He said, sit down. Turned out that man was an ELCA Lutheran pastor. And after conversation, I told him just enough of my story to tell him exactly why I was not coming to his church. And he said, well, I didn't ask you to come to my church. I'm out here. So technically, I came to you. But we're doing this inclusion learning process. We're trying to better connect with our community. How about, as a totally non-faith person, you just consult with us. Just have conversations with us. Well, I was a diversity trainer by that point in time. How different could it be working with a faith community? Sneaky Christian people. He just <laughs> About six months later was when he said, there's somebody cool I'd like you to meet. I said, oh, no, 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 I know how when church people say I want you to meet somebody. He said, it's not in a church. Just come with me. I'll stay with you. I'll be with you so that if you're nervous, if you feel uncertain or unsupported, you'll have someone there who is with you. I've got your back. Take a chance. The person that he took me to meet was the Bishop of Lower Susquehanna Synod, my current other employer. And that conversation we had was my guerrilla candidacy interview to become a pastor. <laughs> it took four or five Lutherans to say, my dear, you have a calling, before I was willing to listen to it. It took that long to re-earn my trust. But this past weekend, I attended an ordination on Sunday. The ordination of my seventh intern in five years. One Baptist, one Episcopal, one Lutheran, three UCC, one non-denominational chaplain, You see, it turns out that there were more people than me 
who didn't know that the church was a safe and welcoming place for them, and someone who was willing to meet them where they were, work with them to earn and build trust, learn and listen to their story, and make brave, bold choices with them to choose love even over tradition allowed them to live into their gifts in such a way that now the number of people that group has touched is beyond count. I would say at this point, I've probably trained, I train rostered leaders, that's one of the things that I do. I have trained over 5,000 leaders in the church in areas of racial justice, LGBTQIA plus cultural competency, restorative justice and healing practices, safe conversations, community engagement. I've worked with about 15 different synods, all in consulting and large speaking at events, gatherings. There's a lot of folks who have done a lot more, but I'd say I've done my part for the church. But if someone hadn't chosen to meet me where I was, to show me love, and to extend me invitation, none of that would ever have been. So going back to Herod, I told you we'd come back to him. And I do try to keep my promises as long as I can choose love first. Herod had a choice. There was the option of following long history, long tradition, honoring obligation, keeping of a promise made without full knowledge of the situation. Or Herod had the choice of saying my first and most important obligation is always to love, to fairness and equity, and to care of what is best for the people that I am in service of. And my friends, the same choice is yours today. I don't know if y'all watched any news yesterday. But it was a little scary. There are moments when I despair, looking out at what has become of the way that people speak to each other, that people exist in shared community. Our political world is necessary. Without it, we don't have things like trash pickup, right? Funding for schools, nursing homes. We are called to engage in the political realm. I do not believe no matter what party you affiliate with, no matter what leader that you like or are more excited or support, that we are ever called in service of our community to pick up a weapon. But somehow, there are those who believe in a certain form of right and that it has become more than the importance of love of neighbor, of safety and care, and of places of welcome and inclusion being the priority. That doesn't lead us anywhere towards the kingdom of God. So as many of you know, in the church, there are lots of different options and choices that people make. There are congregations that are open to supporting refugees. There are congregations that are welcoming of newcomers, and there are many that are not. 
because law is law. Right is right, tradition is tradition. It made my heart sing to hear the joy in which you spoke just this morning about seeing a child in school and a family doing well because at the end of the day, regardless of what side of a made up line they are from, children are children and families are families, are they not? There are folks like myself who may love and partner differently. There are many churches, many congregations in this synod that will not allow me to preach or to preside at communion within their space. There are some that will not serve me communion or allow me to partake of the sacraments in their building. So for allowing me here today, thank you. There are choices that you're called to make, church. There are options in front of you. And this time that we're entering into, people are drawing more and more lines in the sand and digging deeper holes on their side of the line, refusing to move. And so as much as it would be nice to be able to say, I'm going to just step back from this, there are people dying out there. There are people walking away from church and not returning, and we're seeing it more and more each year. And at this point, according to the latest very neutral surveys, as many as 20 to 25 percent or even more of people that are under the age of 30 identify as something other than straight. There are also more and more individuals that come from mixed ethnicity backgrounds. It is estimated that there will be more interracial or multiracial people in the United States than people from a singular cultural background by 2030. So if we want to truly get outside of our doors, be part of our community, meet people where they are at, and offer an informed, welcoming, invitational love that does not require people to live into a certain condition for God to love them, we're going to have to do a few things differently, my friends. And that choice is in your hands right now. I can't tell you how God is to speak into your heart. That is between you and Jesus. That is the Holy Spirit and your prayer time. But I would invite you to ask, as you are reading your Bible, as you are praying and spending time with spirit, as you are looking at the faces in your community and remembering all the times over and over again that you have been taught and told that every single one of us is made in the image of God, created divinely with purpose and intention and given unique gifts, each one part of the body of Christ, some the hands, some the feet, some the chin, some the elbow, but each one necessary in our difference and our function. And all needed because of those differences, my friends, I ask you to be thoughtful and intentional about what invitation, what welcome, what witness, what being a follower of Jesus looks like when it comes to who you welcome into service, into leadership, into outreach, into ministry. Sitting in the back of the church and being told to be silent is not welcome. Being told you can come, but don't talk too much and don't bring certain behaviors into our space. You can come, but not your family. All of it not welcome. But embrace 
invitation. We will go to you and meet you there. That is the love of disciples who went forth two by two into every region of the known world and there built churches. So in your prayer and discernment in these coming months, with one of the leaders who welcomed me from the beginning, may having the gift of that leadership be your inspiration. And so as I finish today, I wanted to wear something as I was preaching that connected me with this congregation. Because I believe that I was called by God to be in this place, in this moment. And the story, yep, most of you know the story behind this stole, do you not? That there were, there was, Many years ago, once upon a time, right? Someone broke into the church and stole all the purses, stole the things, and then they were discovered, dumped, gutted, and placed in the creek. And your pastor, in hip waders, in November, went into the waters and fished out those bags and returned as much as could be returned to the people of the congregation. Could have said, mm, thoughts and prayers. <laughs> could have said, oh, well, isn't that a shame? Maybe we can call somebody else about that. But the faithful witness was in, there is a need. Let me put on my hip waders and go to where the need is and get in the water for the sake of God's people. And one of your own members was so moved by the witness of showing up in body as well as in word by not just talking about it, being about it, as my little God kids be telling me. And that's why the creek and the tree beside it join the bread and the wine that are the body of Christ on this stole. So friends, what does it look like to get in the water of baptism. Not just to remember it, but to wade in it waist deep. Even when the current is strong, even when the air is cold, because God's people need you and you have the choice, will you show up or will you not? And for the little girl that I was, for the interns that I have cared for, for the children who have sat at my feet and been told that they are loved as a pastor called and ordained in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, I have been able to tell those kids how loved they are. I pray that you will choose love over and over again. Thanks be to God.
Jesus. God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection the of the body, body and the, the life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Amen. One in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. You gather your people into the body of Christ. Where your church is wounded, heal it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is divided, reunite it. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. From before the foundation of the world, you are God. Revive ecosystems destroyed by human greed. Curb your, our desire to put wealth ahead of the health of all who call this planet our home. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You establish equity and make justice. Within every nation, tribe, and land, cause laws to be written and customs to be observed that protect the most vulnerable. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. On the cross, your beloved Son endured pain and death. Bring healing in those in need, hope to any in despair, and comfort to the dying. We pray especially for Vaughn, Ron, Lynn, Doreen, Kira, Harry, Marlene, Dick, Donald, Joseph, Mark, Gary, Jim, Florence, those on our prayer list and those whom we name in our hearts are out loud. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You send your spirit into this community of faith. Empower our ministries that serve and build up local communities. Nurture our partnerships with other community organizations. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, Lord, we pray especially for peace. We pray for understanding. We pray for calm. And we pray for all the most peace and love in your world. Help us to understand one another, to accept one another, and to love one another as you have loved us. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All peoples praise you, O oh God. We give you thanks and praise for the lives of our loved ones who now rest in you, especially Deputy Fernando Esqueda. In the fullness of time, gather us with all your saints in light. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share peace with your neighbor. Peace. Peace.
All right, we're all set. <laughs> Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gathered into one with the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have mercy. 
Please stand as you're able. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Gracious God, in this meal you've drawn us to your heart and nourished us at your table with food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Now send us forth to be your people in the world, to proclaim your truth this day and evermore, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. And God sends us into the world on mission to the world. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Share love with the world and share the good news. Be to God.